This man was a hero better than any of us. Anyway, we're going to come. Well, let's go to our friend now, Daniel Henninger. Um, I want you to watch this first. I think he's been uh, willing to show a deeply held grievance about what he considers to be the loss of the Soviet Union. Um, you would have thought that uh, after uh, a couple of decades that there would be an awareness on the part of any Russian leader that uh, the path forward is not uh, to revert back to the kinds of uh, practices that uh, you know, were so prevalent during the Cold War, but in fact, uh, to move forward. All right, folks, uh, that's Barack Obama's uh, brilliant analysis of uh, <laughs> Vladimir Putin. Joining us now is Daniel Henninger, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and deputy editorial page uh, director at the Wall Street Journal. Welcome back, sir. Good to be with you, Steve. Well, good to talk to you. I, I, you know, you wrote a great piece, American Fatigue Syndrome, uh, Syndrome and I want to get to that. This kind of fits in with it. Let, let me ask you, what do you, what do you think of uh, you know, Obama's analysis, uh, maybe psychoanalysis, if you will, of Vladimir Putin? Well, uh, it's sort of fascinating in the abstract, except that uh, Vladimir Putin uh, has annexed Crimea and now has between 50 and 100,000 Russian troops sitting on the border of eastern Ukraine. So while the President of the United States is trying to uh, sort of give us tutorials in the uh, post-Cold War world, uh, the President of Russia is grabbing territory. Uh, so it would seem that just on the basis of uh, what we call real politic, the, uh, the, the Russians are a lot further ahead than the Americans right now. And the question is, does Barack Obama actually believe that he's going to be able to talk his way out of the Ukrainian crisis? And since he had his uh, Secretary of State, John Kerry, sitting yesterday in Paris for four fantastic hours with uh, the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, the result of which was zero, it would suggest that um, perhaps the president is uh, pursuing the wrong, the wrong strategy here on Ukraine. Yeah, one would have to think so. And, you know, it, it, it comes back to the, the piece you wrote. It was such a great piece about, uh, about American uh, fatigue um, syndrome, as you put it. And uh, to a great extent, it's true. I mean, I've seen polls that say we have no business worrying about what Russia does in Ukraine. And, you know, I don't know if they've asked the question, but if they ask the question, what if, what if uh, Russia goes so far as to uh, uh, touch a NATO country? Would we, <clears throat> should we then uh, go get involved in, and, and defend them militarily? And I bet you there'd be at least half the people in this country that say no. Yeah. Well, they probably would have said no in 1939 as well, uh, Steve, when um, Adolf Hitler was taking over the Sudetenland uh, near uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, the, yeah, I understand the fatigue that many Americans uh, feel after our uh, war in Iraq and uh, the time spent in Afghanistan. But the world, you know, just events don't stand still for uh, the way Americans feel at any point in time. And under circumstances like this, as uh, back before the war, it, it is really the obligation of the President of the United States to show leadership and try to explain to the American people the realities and imperatives of becoming, uh, being the world's lone superpower and explaining why if activities like Russia's in Ukraine are allowed to proceed, Though that sort of thing is likely to happen elsewhere, in China or in Korea, and uh, it will not be in the U.S. interest if the world uh, degrades as a result of uh, uh, annexations and land grabs of this sort, uh, the world economy will suffer. And if the world economy suffers, uh, the average American is going to suffer, too. But um, it's not you know, it is not the job of the average American person to uh, try to summon these kinds of geostrategic realities on their own. I'm not saying they can't, but that's not their job. That's why they hire the president of the United States. Right. That's and, why we give him all this power. And by the way, the North Koreans and the South Koreans were shooting each other with yeah. artillery fire. Second time that's happened under, under uh, the Obama administration. But let me also, in your piece, you also talk about the Republican 
uh, and the Republicans, and maybe specifically a nominee down the road, has to be able to uh, convince the American public and, and do uh, the convincing that Barack Obama is unwilling or unable to do. Well, that's an interesting point. Uh, up until recently, the uh, Republicans have been uh, kind of reluctant to talk about this subject, uh, mainly because of those opinion polls showing American fatigue. But I was very much encouraged, John, over the weekend to see that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, both Governor Christie and uh, Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin appearing at an event in Las Vegas spoke out very strongly about uh, the need to uh, protect and sustain the U.S. role uh, in maintaining the world's security. And uh, Marco Rubio has said the same sort of thing. So I think that uh, the Republicans, especially those thinking of uh, running for president, are beginning to find their footing on this subject. And they're finding their footing in no small part because uh, they, like the rest of us, are watching the president, uh, Barack Obama, pretty much flounder vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Vladimir Putin. And, uh, and, and I think they're concluding that this is just not uh, the appropriate uh, kind of political strategy uh, for the president of the United States to, boot, to be presenting. And so they're going for the traditional alternative. I was, I was encouraged by that. All right. Truth be told, uh, he's also floundering uh, with uh, this Obamacare. Uh, the rollout was a disaster. Today is the deadline, although I thought the deadline was extended. I, I, I'm confused about that. But today's the deadline I keep hearing all over the news media. So they, they, they get their talking orders right from the White House, so they must know better than me. And if today's the deadline, uh, guess what? The website went down several yeah. times this morning. So here we go again. And they announced that 6 million people, and then I heard over the weekend it's up to 6.5 million people have quote unquote signed up. Uh, but of course, they don't know how many people have actually paid premiums of that six and a half million. So, but your 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 most recent piece that I'm looking at here is the left can win elections, but why can't it run a government? Mm -hmm. And I think Obamacare is the perfect example of that. Yeah, that's right. The left, uh, as they say, can win elections, but they can't govern. And uh, I think it's because they have this kind of grandiose, incredibly grandiose model in their mind of how one grand scheme fits all. And especially with Obamacare, when you think about it, uh, Steve, the idea that you're going to create this insurance policy that would cover everybody under any circumstances, that is so out of sync with the way people live their lives now in the age of modern technology, which allows people to use apps design the kind of life they want to live, uh, depending on their own circumstances. And in fact, as all of us know, there are sites like eSurance that allow you to go in and design a uh, homeowner's insurance or health insurance based on your circumstances. But the left is always intent on overreaching. But they've done that forever. The big thing here, Steve, Steve was the mandates. Because once the left fails, liberals have always done this sort of thing. But this group is different than the traditional liberals. The left, once they fail, cram it down. They force it down. They tell you what to do. They go, they go to coercion. And the spectacular fail, they can't even coerce people to uh, sign up for Obamacare because the site isn't working. And I think the American electorate is standing out there watching this spectacular fiasco and saying there is something basically wrong with the left's idea of running a government. Well, the polls certainly indicate that. Uh, Obama's approval rating is in various respective polls, the lowest it, it has ever been in those polls. Uh, and, of course, you look at the, uh, the Senate races where so many Democrats are in trouble that now they're coming forward and they want, they want to make amendments uh, to the, uh, almost more, make amends uh, to the Obamacare fiasco. And Harry Reid uh, reportedly has said he will not bring those to the floor. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had a piece on the journal editorial page today about the demographics of uh, the upcoming election by the head of uh, the Pew polls. And he was pointing out that uh, Obama support has fallen significantly among millennials, uh, young people in their 20s. He's the ones who put his presidency across the goal line in 2008 and 2012. And they were the targets of Obamacare, and they're the ones who seem to be losing faith fastest and his ability to govern. It, it, is, it is incredible, Daniel, and uh, I'll tell you what, uh, if any, anything short of a landslide in November, I'm going to be bitterly disappointed. Hey, I, I look forward to our next chat. Thank you very much.
All right, good to talk to you guys. Take care. Steve. Daniel Henninger, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and uh, deputy editorial page director of the Wall Street Journal. When we come back, we'll discuss all of it uh, with the panel right here on the Steve Malzberg Show on Newsmax Television.